Joe takes bad financial advice and moves to Germany to coach the Munich Ravens. Josh Browning thinks he's a top 32 quarterback, and Hawk thinks C.J. Stroud is top five in the league. Panthers owner David Tepper spilled his drink on a fan, and Jameis Winston adds another reel to his shacked in a full worthy career. All of this and much, much more on this race-friendly, fat and atlas, New Year's same pod episode of the Tomahawk Show. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the world-famous Tomahawk Show, brought to you by the DraftKings Network and Metal Arc Media. As always, I am one of your co-hosts, Andrew Hawkins, former NFL wide receiver and media personality, joined by the humblest of all co-hosts, NFL uh, 10-time Pro Bowler, Pro Football Hall of Famer, College Football Hall of Famer, and all of the above, and now first-year coach for the Munich Ravens, my dog, Joe Thomas, is in the building. Joe, how are you doing, man? I'm doing amazing. Uh, I know I told you I was in Germany, but as you can see by this palm tree over my, my <laughs> shoulder, I'm actually in a broom closet somewhere near you in Miami. That is what we call in the culture cap. Also joining us in person, <laughs> live and in, indirect, Juju Gotti, uh, Way Cross's favorite son in the building. Juju, how you doing today, man? Pretty good, brother. How you doing, man? I'm good. Man. You got a naysayer so, t-shirt on. Bro, you got a goatee, and I can't see nothing but this goatee. <laughs> I haven't heard nothing but goatee all morning. So salute to that goatee. What are, how do we feel about my goatee? I don't feel great about you it. You don't feel I'm great about it. All right. I, I love it. you. You're a handsome, attractive brother, so you don't have no problems, but I don't know if I feel great about the goatee. I, felt, I thought this was going to be a nice change of pace. Joe, what are your thoughts on the goatee? Uh, I don't know many brothers that have a goatee hawk, but for some reason, <laughs> hey. just like you do a good job of like splitting the line between black and white on cultural issues, like you do the same thing with facial hair issues. Thank you, man. And I'm really respecting it. But I think what I you need it. to do is like the big Steve Harvey bushy mustache, oh which would really this kind is... of give you that 51% white guy in my book. And uh, I promise <laughs> to do the same being in Germany. And I think it would be a great thing for the Tomahawk show to see if we could get Juju with a nice fat mustache as well. The fact that you think I want to be 51% white guy, number one. Number two, you picked the worst week is this? <laughs> for me to be Steve Harvey. Steve right. Harvey has been getting crushed on social media thanks right. to a world-famous Cat Williams interview with Shannon Sharp. Bro, um, you, look, you look like you got beef with Lou Kang right now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I got low approval ratings <laughs> on, on the mustache. Speaking, speaking of low approval ratings, Joe, I need a grade from you Thanks. on Germany. Joe has moved to Germany officially, everybody. He is now in Germany. I believe Munich is where he is uh, directly. Joe, get, how has it been so far in your mm. new land? It's been A+. plus. You know, in life, I like doing hard things. I like adventure and as soon as things got really comfortable in wisconsin in retirement i'm like you know what i need to do is just rip my family out of america out of their comfortable lives in wisconsin and go pay to coach <laughs> the munich ravens football team in germany and live in the city and just completely flip their life on their head and it's been everything we've asked for it's been confusing it's been funny <laughs> it's been full of tears and today we took the kids to school and on the way home the entire city was shut down by an enormous tractor farmer truck driver protest which was very incredible because Man. it felt like you were in the middle of history as you see all these like news cameras however i don't really know anything about what it was all about but it feels cool because it's exciting and it's new uh just like your mustache that's why i like your mustache <laughs> and your, uh, your goatee thing going on there it's adventurous i like that so okay so are you the what what is your title for the coach you are coaching for the munich ravens are you the offensive coordinator or offensive line coach it's probably everyone's asking me like so are you the head coach or like you the <laughs> offensive coordinator and i'm like no nah, no nah, that's way too much responsibility for me i don't know if you noticed when i said that i am paying to coach the munich ravens therefore i would not accept any role above offensive line coach that's just perfect for me and actually the great and famous bob wiley of hard knocks fame is one of my assistant offensive line coaches so the oh, two wow. of us 
are double teaming these German guys. And uh, if you can cut that up and put that on social media, that might get a few clicks. Well, yeah, especially from the way you worded that. But also, um, you guys might have a better offensive line uh, coaching tandem than a lot of NFL teams right now. How much are you getting paid, Joe? (laughs) So I'm getting 1,000 euros, not per day, not per week, but per month. Nice. Which is a uh, a hefty paycheck when you consider that my rent is fifty eight hundred euros mm. per month. So, <laughs> not even including the English private school that the kids have to go to, or the cost of living of living in Munich, which is pretty high, um, or just the general bouginess that I live my life. Um, <laughs> I'm losing on rent alone forty eight hundred dollars a month to be able to come out here for my little adventure. So. It's another great investment, uh, along with joining you on the Tomahawk Show after all these years. So I feel like it's just one one great investment in my financial retirement uh, after another. Worth it. This is why I handle all the business for Tomahawk Show, Juju, because the kid has shit for brains and he doesn't have no basic math that you shouldn't pay five times the amount of rent that you're making. Bro, you, uh, look like, you look like Scotty Pippen that one year. He had to go to you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, at least i didn't buy the private plane like scotty pippen did yeah uh, you so, took the goatee i took his financial <laughs> advice you like right. own the lamb <laughs> all, all right, right. so you're it. losing all your money joe <laughs> in munich uh but yep. you're enjoying the experience your kids are in school was today their first day of school it was yeah it was really cool and i actually had like that first day of school jitters that you had you know when you're in kindergarten and then you go to first day middle school high school like even i remember first day in the nfl right when your eyes are wide and you're nervous you got those butterflies um because like i mentioned like we had a great life in wisconsin there was nothing wrong with it uh and i ripped my children (laughs) out of their comfortable life to take them to germany to put them in school where their classmates are trying to speak to them in german so i feel there's a lot of pressure on them having like a great experience, even though we're only going to be here for eight months. Um, so it was a, it was definitely like a great feeling when one, you dropped them off and they were not crying. And two, you picked them up from school and they were shouting at you, but they were shouting like, Hey, it was a lot of fun. We had a great day, made, made some new friends. And everybody in my school was swearing. Yeah. My kids would never, there is no way my kids would be able to handle that. Absolutely not. They, I, like I get that pressure because you're you're probably building a lot of childhood trauma in them right now, and it's going to be all your fault. So this is a lot of pressure. If this goes great. You're the man. If it goes terrible, daddy's going to be alone on Christmas for a long time. Damn. Are you ready yeah. for that kind so of pressure? So we're minus forty eight hundred euros uh, just rent alone. And then now, if I think to the future, what is the present value discount rate of the therapy that they're going to have to go through later in life that I'm going to have to pay for, (laughs) for this little German experience? So the numbers are not looking any better as we continue to talk about it. All right. As we put a button on the Munich Ravens update, Joe is going to be doing all his Tomahawk shows from live Munich, Germany. Um, we found out my little cousin actually played for the team he's coaching for. Oh, he was Lord. telling us the whole time he was going here, and he sent like a, a player, and it was like a logo, and I'm like, that logo looks familiar. Yeah. Come to find out, my little cousin Xri was a linebacker for this team a year ago, and I said, are you going back? And he said, no, there's just not enough money, oh. so I got to go somewhere else. <laughs> and I'm like, well, one of my buddies is there as the assistant to the assistant offensive line coach. He's paying the coach, um, and maybe he will give you some of the salary he's not getting so you can come back. Did you get a report on him? Was he any good? Yeah, so actually the guys remembered him, the coaches remembered him, and they said he was a great player, and they wish he would have come back. But like you said, not a lot of money here in uh, NFL pseudo-Europe here. (laughs) Um, But the reason we started talking about that, Hawk, is because all my buddies that – either currently play in the NFL and they're kind of getting to the end or are recently retired. I've been teasing them like you, like, Hey, you should come back. We got a spot for you. And so I sent you the video of our new receiver to see if you felt a little intimidated by his quickness. (laughs) And I felt there was a little jealousy, a little nervousness. And that's why you had to kind of start firing some stuff back to let me know that you still had it and that you were the same old Hawk. Maybe once, not for a whole season, but I think we could still get one game out of you. I don't think, A, you could get a game out of me because I I am very good at business and I understand what your salary cap is, number one. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) Number two, I have a a strong feeling your health insurance is not as great as it should be for someone my age 
<laughs> to try to come back and play football. And I'm going to be paying for whatever injuries I incur for the rest of my life, <laughs> right. which is something I also don't want to be doing, Joe. Yeah, hopefully you fudged some of those uh, reports when you left the NFL and added some extra injuries so that like when you accrue the injuries in the ELF, you can go back and say, oh, yeah, I got those in the NFL, that uh, you know, broken leg and ACL tear. That was actually from my time in New England. I'm not sure if you've heard of them. They're yeah, the Patriots. They are. Uh, and it was not me being carried off on a stretcher after my first ELF play. <laughs> ELF, that's what it is. All right, so I'm going to become playing in, in, in the ELF, um, which sounds like you're making a derogatory <laughs> term towards me. But let's get into some headlines, because I'm sure your owner <laughs> does not have as much money as the Panthers owner. And the Panthers owner was uh, videoed throwing a drink on an opposing Jacksonville Jaguar fan, Juju, I'm gonna start with you. What was your what, what were you thinking when you saw uh, old David Tepper tossing a drink on a fan he was pissed at? Bruh, that was the lamest thing I done seen that week. Uh, last week, that was the lamest thing of the week. Joke of the week, David Tepper. If you're gonna throw a drink on somebody, number one, you square, you lame, every, put every word against it. Uh -huh. But you gonna throw it from a high position down on people who can't even get back at you. That's, that's a, double square, bro. That's so. And you the owner, the leader of men. I don't know that hundred. How how much you got fined for that? Three hundred thousand. I think it should have been higher, bro. A little bit because just because how square it. That ain't was. nothing to him. That you know what I mean? Three hundred k ain't nothing. That's, like he on a basketball wife throwing, is, throwing drinks and faces. He's a very rich person, um, and. I, I, it does not surprise me that he is new to the NFL and he just went back <laughs> into how he always is, probably with regular humans, because hey. he has so much money. Have you ever thrown a drink on somebody? Hell no. Nah. Never threw a drink on Never anybody? Never in my entire life. Joe, have you ever thrown a drink on somebody? No, that's the softest move ever. Right. Like, who throws a drink? It's, it reminds me of the Austin Powers. Who <laughs> you drink. know where this is going, like, Carl. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I've thrown a drink on people. <laughs> I have. That's my version of, like, you know, I I want the fight to start. Yeah. And that is my version of getting it. It's either that or you hit somebody. This is in right. my younger days when I was a little bit more feisty. <laughs> and it was always the first thing I went to. But I've absolutely thrown a drink in somebody's face and said, Damn, let's get bro. to it. And you know what happened after that, Juju? We got to it. We got to it. That's just <laughs> that's step two. Yeah, you're right about it. You know, when you fight a lot, that just comes along with the territory. See, Joe don't have to fight because he's 6'8", <laughs> and people assume that he can fight. <laughs> See, me, I'm the kind of, I'll never assume that. I yeah. can, I need you to show me. Yeah. And probably a couple times. <laughs> yeah. Because I'll come back. I don't mind losing. So we, I wanna, we're yeah. probably going to have to fight at least three times before I get it into my head. These days, I, don't, I assume your, everybody like, knows UFC. Like, yeah, I don't want to fight nobody. Nowadays, it's a different world. <laughs> right. Either UFC or they got a gun. Right. Two, like, I was in the right era for that. So if you're that fan, what are you doing, Juju? Man, I'm trying to get up this rail. Or no, Matter of fact, do I know that it's David Tepper? You know it's David Tepper. Oh, I'm falling out. My eyes burning out. I can't, I got, I can't see. Ah, ah, and I'm finna bump my head on the steps. Ah, ah, I'm traumatized. I can't even go back to work tomorrow. Bumping your head on the steps is a vet move. <laughs> you feel me? Yes, that's that's absolutely because they can't prove head trauma. Right. That is the rule. You got to act like it's acid, bump your head off the rail, and then you know just start man? convulging in the middle of the aisle. And make sure it's on video. It got to be. Got to be. That'll be my Panthers. He got to be the worst owner in the league. And For I don't sure. even like to make that assertion. But at this stage, if you're throwing drinks on people, right. it was like one, it was one of those moments where whenever it happened, it made all the other business moves make sense. Right. Where it was like, oh, okay, now I know what's <laughs> going on with the organization. Right. That's why you took uh, Bryce Young instead of C.J. Stroud. Okay, it's, It I was see. like everything started <laughs> adding up to me, Joe. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, you instantly knew that he's just insulated himself with people that are yes men his whole life. Mm -hmm. And he's got no ability to have somebody tell him something he doesn't like to hear, right? Mm -hmm. And it's pretty obvious, like, after firing a couple coaches here, back-to-back -back seasons, that he really doesn't have the ability to make level-headed decisions that you have to as an owner. Uh, and if he throws a drink on me, you know what I'm doing? First thing I'm doing is I'm going right into the bathroom. I'm licking every square inch of that thing. And I'm going with all those Oh, oh wait, hold on one second. Brother, what do you and mean I'm going to say, that? hey, this drink a family that show, on gave me all of these diseases. I'm practically <laughs> dead. I gave it to all my family members. Oh, the amount of money that he's going to have to pay me off to not take <laughs> him to court is at least <laughs> half of his entire... I, I'm going to be a part owner of the Carolina Panthers <laughs> yeah. by the end of the week. Well, you, that way. you definitely committed more than anybody else. <laughs> right. and you, just, 
you probably deserve whatever they give you with that. But it turns into the outbreak monkey for the <laughs> <Yeah>. cash. <laughs> He was like, I'll double down. Yo, you're a wild boy, man. I love it. All right, we're going to take a quick break here on the Tomahawk Show. When we come back, we're going to get into the Black Monday that was. All right? Coming up soon. All right, to kick off uh, talking about Black Monday, um, we're going to start with the Jameis Winston play because I do feel like the way that Jameis Winston ended the game on Sunday directly contributed to at least one coach losing <laughs> their job. So if you don't know what happened, Jameis Winston was put in the game, the backup quarterback, in a game where the New Orleans Saints were winning 41-17, to and he was asked to get in the victory formation and nail it out. Jameis famously said that the team in the huddle decided that, no, they were going to give the ball to Jamal, Mur- Jamal Williams to ensure that he got his you know, first and only touchdown of the season, Saints players were happy. Dennis Allen was not. He went to go uh, shake hands with then Falcons head coach Arthur Smith. Arthur Smith had a bunch of choice words for him um, that started with the letter F and rhymed with Ool Smith. <laughs> and, you know, Jameis Winston came out and apologized to Dennis Allen. He said that, you know, it was a team decision, a team decision that the head coach was not a part of, apparently. Um and then, you know, everyone had differing opinions, Joe. Even Shannon Sharp called for Jameis Winston to be cut immediately because he was not listening to the request of the head coach. Joe, I have a feeling I know what your take is going to be, but as an offensive line coach for the Munich Ravens, uh, how would you handle a situation like this? Is he a captain on this team? Does he really believe that he is still a captain? Because I feel like <laughs> as much as I enjoy Jameis, because he's great content and he always comes up with some interesting stuff. I feel like he's pretty convinced that he's still like the captain of the ship and he's not ready to relinquish that role or that mentality. And so when he says, yeah, it's a team decision. Like I'm pretty convinced that he is definitely (laughs) in his mind, like the leader in that locker room still. Right. No question. I mean, Jameis has main character energy every time, which is why you love him. And I think also his teammates love him and they backed him up. If you watch the play. Yeah. Everybody was in on like, yeah, we're getting this dude a touchdown. We don't care what the coach says. So is that more indicative on Jameis Winston or is that more indicative of what they feel about the Saints head coach, Juju? Right. I think whatever indicative is within or without, I think (laughs) if you don't want us to score this touchdown, stop us from scoring this damn touchdown. Don't come out here giving me the unwritten rules. You sad. Bro, you our rival. The Falcons and the Saints been rivals. Uh Bro, we scored a touchdown and got y'all coach fired, sent his ass home with the Falcons. (laughs) I would love to say that as if you my rival. So salute to Jameis Winston. It was indicative, though. Yeah, Yeah, I I, I think Jameis (laughs) should probably get both coaches fired. And that would be, that would make Jameis even more the GOAT. If he got his coach fired and the other coach fired. And I was with you. I'm kind of like, I didn't see the play before I saw the controversy around it. Yeah. And I was like, yo, stop him. This is football. I, I don't subscribe to the whole unwritten rules, mercy. Like, yo, we're getting paid out here. Yeah. Every play matters to somebody. And then I saw the play. And they absolutely lined up in a victory formation <laughs> as if they were going <laughs> to nail it out on the one. Got to keep your head turn, on swivel, bro. And turned around and handed it off. <laughs> I would I would have respected it more if Jameis was like, yo, just get in the regular formation. Yeah. Show them we're going to run a play so that the defense can adjust accordingly. It was absolutely a dirty move, but I don't think that was Jameis' intention. <laughs> I he, think it was better this way. I respect him more <laughs> for victory formation running it through there. <laughs> Jameis might be a little bit of a lunatic, but he's my kind of lunatic. Yes, That's sir. just what I feel about it, Joe. You got to love Jameis because this just plays perfectly into his brand, into his personality. Like, He's so delusional, he doesn't even realize that if they line up in victory formation and run a play, that's offensive on every level, no matter who they're playing, (laughs) no matter what the situation is. Like, you have told them, we've given up, the game is over, we don't want anybody to get hurt. And then to hand it off to your running back and try to score and then be excited about it and say, yeah, it was a team decision. Like, that's why we love Jameis Winston, because it doesn't make sense to any human being that has any common (laughs) sense that's played any level of football. But to Jameis, it makes perfect sense. NFC player of the week, bro. In my book. (laughs) Play caller of the week and everything. I think Jameis Winston's highlight tape outside of playing football is going to be better than his actual. (laughs) And not because he doesn't make plays. Jameis is a really good quarterback. That's the other thing, that Jameis is actually, uh, like, underappreciated 
for his yeah. actual abilities. Right. Like he's a really good, talented quarterback, but you see why all these other things have held him back because <laughs> there is some decision making. When he was coming out of college and they were talking about the crab legs, and I'm uh, like, I don't trust him on the field because typically in my in my experience, how you approach life is how you approach football. So if you're a bad decision maker off the field, yeah. you're probably going to be a bad decision maker on the field. And I'd be damned if that might not have been my best take on earth because yeah. this was a bad decision. And it was yeah. a badly executed decision. Even if you make the decision yeah. to line up in victory formation and then score is a I don't I hope people realize how wild that is, Juju. Yeah, bro, knowing Jameis how we know Jameis now. Don't it make you see that Florida State crab leg situation just a <laughs> slightly different? different. <laughs> he probably walked out like, I, I know the person who he, gave me these. He really thought it was okay. Right. Knowing what I know now about Jameis, that is a perfect point, Juju. We need to revisit right. that entire scandal right. because no, even this situation, I don't feel like anybody's really mad except Shannon Sharp. Right. Who, I love Unk, but he's the only one who takes this like – Seriously, yeah. because it's like, oh, that's Jameis being Jameis. His teammates think that. I'm the Falcons. I'm sure right. are like, hey man, that's what that's what you get when you sign up with Jameis Winston. Right, right. That crab leg situation. Yeah, you're right. We need to we need to do a, <laughs> a, a, a revisionist history lesson because I, I need to see the security cam because I can promise you the way that everyone saw it was right. not the way it was playing in Jameis's not mind. Not at all. Not even a second of it. All right. So our Arthur Smith gets fired. And there's a lot of conversation around a lot of coaches, a lot of teams. Josh McDaniels was out this year, Frank Reich, um, Brandon Staley. At the, at the taping of this podcast, we don't know what's going on with Bill Belichick yet. Um, it feels like there's going to be a parting of ways between he and the Patriots, and I think it could make sense. Joe, from where you sit at this moment, do you think the Patriots should, A, move on from Bill Belichick? And if so, what is Bill Belichick's next move? I think it's a difficult decision for everybody, but it's the right time to do it. And honestly, I think Bill Belichick has made those cold-blooded decisions his entire career with everybody, going back to Richard Seymour, to when they split with Tom Brady, that he's actually expecting it because he knows that he's beyond his time there and that his message is being lost on the boys there in New England. And the fact that they have such a high draft pick and they can replace uh, – their quarterback right now, Mac Jones, with whoever they want in the draft and kind of start over, it's a good reset for everybody. And I think Bill would probably appreciate the fact that he's going to get the ax in a cold-blooded way, the way mm. he's given it to so many other players throughout <sighs> his career. And he'll fi probably find a pretty good landing spot because there's going to be a, several teams. I'm not going to say a lot because I do think there's plenty of owners who think, kind of like I've been saying, that you know maybe – the Bill Belichick days at the NFL have passed him a little bit because his ability to connect with players maybe isn't mm. there the way it used to be when he could just turn, you know, turn the lights off and torture them into <laughs> reading their playbooks and showing up to practice on time. Um, and you got to kind of change your approach a little bit, but there's still a few owners out there. And I think there's teams that are stacked, namely the LA chargers that have a great quarterback that would mm -hmm. gladly sign Bill Belichick or make some type of minimal trade to be able to get him. I love that. Live by the gun, you die by the gun take when it comes to Bill <laughs> Belichick. It always, every gangster movie you've ever seen, right. you've seen the biggest tyrant go out the way that they that they, that they live their life. Right. Robert so that, Kraft with a tear coming out of his yeah. eyes. I, I am my brother's keeper. Yes, Man, I am. <laughs> it happens every time. I love that. That is, that is a great take from Joe. I love, the thing I love about the Tomahawk show in this current iteration is I can take Joe's takes that he yeah. gives me on Monday go throughout the rest of the week on ESPN and just spit them like they're mine. <laughs> there was a time when this was reversed and Joe was on like Thursday Night Football and I was giving great tech. He would just go take them and put them on national TV. This is why there's a brotherhood here. See, nah, this is what Cat we Williams was talking about, bro. This is what <laughs> Central Entertainer did, uh, Cat Williams, and this is not right. I still stand for takes. Joe. Don't be stealing, bro. Nah, I still take. <laughs> Joe knows I still take. Uh, we share takes, man. I give him some takes. He gives me some takes. You know? Yeah, fair exchange. You know, it keeps us afloat. That's, yeah. that's At least y'all in cahoots. You yeah, we in cahoots. Exactly. Give me the kind of tapes or somebody. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Anytime you hear Joe breaking down receiver film, trust yeah. me, that, that came from me. 1,000%. <laughs> he texts me on the side. And if I'm ever talking about offensive line play, it's 1,000% something that Joe said to me. Nice. And I'm, I'm on there acting like I'm an expert. All right. In the coaching carousel, there will also be another name that will probably be inserted, and that is that of uh, Jim Harbaugh. Jim Harbaugh playing in the national championship at this moment. I think he played in the national championship by the time this airs. Yeah. Uh, 
Congratulations, by the way. Congratulations, <laughs> Jim Harbaugh, on the big time <laughs> victory against Washington. <laughs> Joe, does Jim Harbaugh leave college and go to the NFL? I don't think he does. Honestly, I think he really likes where he is at Michigan. Mm. And I think he realizes that he's got enough self awareness that he doesn't, he's not normal enough to be able to get along with an owner in the NFL for longer than just a few <laughs> years. And I think the comfort that he's built himself at his alma mater allows him a great level of freedom to be weird and quirky and bend the rules as much as he possibly can at Michigan. And he's going to be forever forgiven. So I don't think he really wants to leave. And I think he's getting paid plenty of money. And I don't think he's searching for that next challenge, even though a lot of people are going to say, oh, he's, he's going to want to be able to do it at the NFL level. Like, I think he just loves football and he wants to win. And he doesn't care if it's peewee football. He doesn't care if it's the Elf League coaching Andrew Hawkins over here in Munich, yep. <laughs> or if it's at Michigan in college football in the Big Ten. Yeah, I, I, I think I disagree. I think I disagree. Yeah. I do believe he's quirky. I do believe he just genuinely loves football. Yeah. Uh, but I do think he has that kind of personality, like the dad in Talladega Nights, where if everything, if you're in a spot for too long and it's going too good, you got to blow the shit up and move on. <laughs> I feel like he's reached that point with Michigan. Yeah. You know, he played there. He came back to bring him back to national prominence. Right. Clearly, he's done that job. Right. I think he wants to get back to the NFL and win the Super Bowl that escaped him yeah. because he lost to his brother, in the big game. They are a football family. His mm -hmm. dad was a coach. And I read this in his Wikipedia. Six or seven years while he was playing in the NFL, yeah. he was a volunteer unpaid coach with Western Kentucky, which was a 1AA team his dad was the head coach of. And he would recruit. Uh -huh. He would coach throughout the whole offseason. And he had the same salary that Joe has right now with the Munich yeah. Ravens yeah. because he just loved football. Yeah. And, you know, he wanted to be around it, which is why he's so successful, I think. He is going to be the most coveted person in this NFL cycle. I think he's going to get one of those jobs. Yeah. Specifically, I could see the La Los Angeles Chargers making the most sense mm. and him going to try to win a Super Bowl, Joe. Dang. You mentioned unpaid, and you said we had the same salary. Technically not true, because Ooh, I'm okay. actually paying to <laughs> coach the Munich Ravens while he was doing it for free uh, at Western Kentucky. So... Does that mean that I love football more than Jim Harbaugh? You it might. Does. It does. I think it does because you also went to Germany. Because right. I don't, I, I love football. I'm not moving to Germany. All right, move his family to Germany. I don't know what's what's worse for the Hawkins family, Western Kentucky or Germany. I feel like you might be more welcome <laughs> in Germany than <laughs> yeah, the Hawkins family a, going to Western Kentucky. That's a damn good point, and uh, I don't know. I don't think I'd be welcome in either spot. I'll go to Atlanta. <laughs> How about it, Juju? Hey. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're gonna take a quick break. When we come back, we're gonna get into a little bit of Am I Tripping and the NFL playoffs. All right, now let's get into a little bit of a am I trip in one of our favorite segments here on the Tomahawk Show. I'm going to read a statement and then pose it as a question to both Joe and Juju to see if I am tripping. All right, in his post-game interview, after beating the Browns' B-team, Bengals quarterback number two, Jake Browning, said, I'm one of the top 32 quarterbacks in the world and happen to be on the roster with a quarterback who's proven to be top five. Mm -hmm. Am I tripping or has Jake Browning proved he can be a great QB1 in this league, Joe? No, he's not proved that. Come on, man. Like, we know that everybody in the NFL is looking for a, a top-tier quarterback, right? That doesn't mean top 10 or top 5. That just means they believe that this is a guy that can take them to the Super Bowl, not a guy that can win them some games or get them to the playoffs. I believe that everybody is either looking for that top-tier quarterback or they got a guy that's keeping them around and keeping them with their jobs, which obviously as a head coach and GM, that's what your number one priority is, not get fired. But – in the end, they're always looking to replace that guy to get a top-tier guy that can win him a Super Bowl, and I do not believe he is one of those guys that will win a Super Bowl in his NFL career. Oh, man, Joe, you're so <laughs> cynical, man. What happened to the inspirational sports story? What happened to the underdog story, man? The guy that finally got his shot and proved he could do it, Juju. No love for Jake Browning? All right, in the words of Stephen A. Smith, I'm going to put it like this. The brother looked high. <laughs> Cause I do not believe <laughs> he don't believe what he said. Like salute to Jake Brown, man, I'm, I'm so happy for your success. But you a valuable QB two, oh. bro. You are valuable. QB one go down. I think he the best QB two to have. I think right now in the NFL, I call him that. Yeah, but not best. QB one. I can't give no him the QB keys. one. No I, QB one love. If okay, the Falcons they can try out Desmond Ritter. They can give it him the job, but only in Atlanta. 
That's what, only in Atlanta. Jay Brown and only in Atlanta. So he's number thirty-two exactly, is what you're saying. It's like, on the <laughs> nail on the head. <laughs> but look, I a good a good indicator for anybody who's in that scenario is whenever you are playing well, who is the person that they're giving the praise to? Right. And I right. think you see that illustrated by these Cal Shanahan and Mike McDaniel teams. When they were talking about MVP, everybody's talking about Lamar Jackson being the flavor, favorite. And I agree. Right. And they're like, well, what about Browning? Look at his numbers. What about uh, or, or what about Purdy? Look at his numbers. Look at Tua's numbers. What about McCaffrey? What about and, I, and these are great players. Right. But we sit on this podcast and talk about Cal Shanahan drink, Mike McDaniel yeah. and. In that same scenario with Browning, everyone talked about the job Zach Taylor has done. Mm. Not that he found some player that, you know, nobody even saw coming. Right. And unfortunately for, for Browning, he's going to have to get to another situation, mm -hmm. prove it again and probably even more for people to actually assert that he's a top 32 quarterback. Yeah. And nothing wrong with being Brian Hawk. And nothing wrong with being a, of a journey man. Andrew Clearly. Hawkins. You Ain't nothing it? wrong with it, man. Come on over it. here and get you a mic. You what you got, it? Joe? I'm just saying, if if I could talk to him, I would say, okay, you think you're tier one quarterback, you think you're a starter in the NFL, that's great. Who are you replacing? Like, tell me who in the NFL that an NFL team is going to kick to the curb and sign you to a long term quarterback contract. Right. Mm. Tannehill. I mean, we already said Desmond Ritter. Desmond Ritter. That's two. I don't think. But those guys are already being fired. Like, they're already <laughs> looking for their replacement. And Baker. do you think they want to sign another Desmond? Desmond Ritter? Like, <laughs> no. You, you got to tell me an organization is going to stake their future on him. Who, who you want? You want Browning or you want Baker Mayfield, Joe? Mm. You're the GM. I'm thinking Baker. Like, he's played really well this he season. Well. I know his numbers have been up and down a little bit, but That's the Baker me, Mayfield experience. he elevated his offense a few times this season, got him some wins. I don't think Baker's a tier one quarterback, mm -hmm. and I think he is much more mature than he was in Cleveland. But he still has some of that emotional up and down that I think plays into like the momentum of his season where he has a hard time coming back from if he plays a bad game or he makes a bad throw. But I think overall, he's proven that he can be a starter in the NFL. And I think there's going to be some of these analytics teams. This is your take for ESPN on Thursday. Thank you. There's going to be some down. of these analytics teams <laughs> that are looking at the number of injuries that these big dollar starting quarterbacks have gotten this season. And they're saying, hey, it's too risky to put all of this money into one guy who has a high injury rate in today's NFL where these quarterbacks are much more mobile and getting out of the pocket, unlike Peyton Manning and Drew Brees and Tom Brady, who just stood there and never got hurt. And so they're going to take the opposite approach that everybody's taking now and say, hey, we'll take a good quarterback. We'll pay him a decent salary, 20, 25 million a year. And then we'd rather spread that money between a backup quarterback and then some of our other key positions so that we're safe and we're insured in case our starting quarterback likely does get hurt at some point during the season. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't think you're wrong, and I think to Browning's point, he should be doing that. He's an exclusive yeah. rights free agent. I was an exclusive rights free agent. Yeah. Let me tell you what exclusive rights free agent means. <laughs> that means that your option as a free agent this off season yeah. is to accept the league minimum deal that your team gives you, or you don't play in the NFL. Dang. There's no opportunity to match it. There's no opportunity to seek uh, other teams. If a team says we want to sign you back. Uh -huh you sign the league minimum to that contract. So the fact they even call it exclusive rights free agent yeah. is BS, and he knows that. Yeah. And so he's using this as a little bit of a campaign to say, like, oh, this is, might be my last – this might be the last time y'all see me for a while. <laughs> right. So I want you to remember what I'm saying and what I did here, right. and I'll see y'all in two years. Yeah, yeah. It went nothing wrong with what he did. I understand it completely. You get it. Yeah, All for right. sure. Transitioning to a quarterback that it's going to be hard to argue – is not one of the top 32. C.J. Stroud has been a revelation for the Houston Texans. Since he hit the ground running in his rookie regular season, Stroud finished with 4,108 yards, 26 total TDs, 64% uh, completion rate, and only five interceptions. And the Texans finished first in their division with a first-year head coach and a rookie quarterback. Mm. Am I tripping, or is C.J. Stroud the best rookie quarterback we've ever seen? Oof. Ever. Wow. Ever? Not even I, close. Look, I think you might be right. I'm, I'm a prisoner of the moment. Because name <laughs> another one. You know what I mean? Off the top of my head, I can't think of one. To lead the Houston Texans. Like, that's let's put that in big, bold letters. The Houston Texans to the playoffs. 
first That's year. Big deal. And he missed a couple games with a concussion. So, yeah. <laughs> and they lost a couple of them games he missed. So, to get them, I think you might be right. He is the best uh, Ricky quarterback ever. All right, so let me change it up. Let me make it a little more hard for Joe. Joe, where does C.J. Stroud? Is he top 20? Is he top 15? Is he top 10? Is he top 5? Quarterback in the league. Right now. I think he's top 10, to be honest. I think Juju hit the nail on the head, man. What he did with that organization that was in total shitstorm last season uh -huh. and took him to the playoffs this year and not only made him respectable, but he instantly captured that locker room. Like, he got the respect of everybody in that locker room. He got him to work harder. And to me, that's the mark of a great quarterback. That's the mark of a tier one quarterback is when they believe in you that they feel like they have a chance to win every single game they go in. It makes everybody work harder because they don't want to be the one that lets him down. Yeah. And the fact that I said it in the off season that he's the best quarterback in the draft. And you were telling everybody on all of your big networks that you're working for that he's not smart enough and he can't read the defense. <laughs> he's not going to be anything in the NFL. The Just, it perfectly aligns with all the crappy takes that you've had <laughs> over the years on the Tomahawk show. And I'm glad we got the, the cutups to be able to show it right now. Look at this. See, you can go to my Instagram right now. And see the last. Uh, uh... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I broke up. I couldn't hear you, Hawk. It must be bad connection here in Germany. Look, I, CJ Stroud is legit. I'm going to put him in the top five. I think he's yeah. a top five quarterback in Ooh. the NFL Ooh. right now. What's the top five? What's the list? I, off the top. And you guys keep me honest. Let All me know right. if I'm forgetting anybody because I do have football brain. Yeah. It's a real thing. All right. Lamar's up there. Uh -huh. MVP. Mahomes is in the top five. Number one. Uh -huh. Um, I would put uh, Stafford is playing top, top five. five okay. right now in this season. Um, Dak okay. is top five. And then I would probably put CJ number five. Oh, wow. Oh, mine is blown in here. Uh, and uh, what do you want, Josh Allen? <laughs> I'm not saying nothing. I'm just give me who am list. I missing? This Somebody is your list. So I respect the parameters of your list. I'm trying so to think who, who am it. I forgetting? No I Justin to... Herbert, no Tua Tagovailoa, nope. no nope. Josh Allen, no uh, Zach Wilson. I mean, <laughs> you missing all the big dogs. <laughs> Name me any of those quarterbacks. Aaron Rodgers? No. I, I don't want any of those quarterbacks going into the playoffs more than I want C.J. Stroud. Geno Smith. Joe Flacco. Nope, I love G G I love Flacco. Of course, I want Flacco in my heart. Yeah. But if I'm looking on the game tape, I'm looking at the film. I'm going with C.J. Stroud. What C.J. Stroud has done, not just because of the numbers, like yeah. the numbers game is easy because it's like oh, quarterbacks interception. He's a rookie. I can't believe. He but when you watch him play, yo, the dude gets better as the game goes on. If you even right. watch the two films yeah. from the Colts at the beginning of the season, which he played well in, versus the Colts in this last game. Mm -hmm. It, it looks like a rookie sensation versus an all pro. Mm -hmm. Like that's the level of CJ Stroud because this dude is so cool under pressure. Right. Nothing gets to him. He knows the answer to the test. You can't send any blitz at him. You can't send any coverage at him mm -hmm. that he won't diagnose and make a throw at the last possible Awkwardly second too. on the money. Awkwardly. That is so rare. Flip. He yeah. had a situation where he had to come back and win two games for them to be the division champs in the playoffs. The fact that he answered that call with two of his best games of the season mm. tells you more about him than anything. And I'm not bashing Josh Allen, right. but last right. night was a need to have a game. They did pull it out, right. but Josh Allen made it tough. You're right about that. You're right you know? about that, John. And that's something to say for quarterbacks in that moment, Joe. I'm Does C.J. Stroud have a sophomore slump? You know, we've seen so many of these quarterbacks. They have a good first season. Everybody gets a bunch of tape on them. They break them down in the offseason. They mm -hmm. figure out strengths and weaknesses. They come up with some good defenses to be able to handle them. And then all of a sudden, it seems like they have this little bit of a, a, a slump, a little trough. And then a lot of them bounce back out of it. Um, we saw a little bit with Lamar Jackson. You know, he came on the scene. Nobody yep. knew how to handle him. Yep. All of a sudden, teams went out. They started playing a lot of zone, a lot of 6DB stuff where they got everybody's eyes on him. And they kind of contained him for a little bit. And then all of a sudden, boom, he burst back up. And now he's the MVP of the league. Does CJ Stroud have that sophomore slump? I, I think there will be some of that. I don't think he's going to play bad. I think he's still going to play great. Yeah. I think it's not going to be as easy as it was the first year. Because to your point, now everybody, he's not sneaking up on anybody else right. in year two. And we've seen this with all the great quarterbacks. There's always a dip because now they know we have to, we're going to spend our whole offseason figuring out how to stop you. Because yeah. we're going to see you twice a year. And we have to make it hard on you. Yeah. Um, but that being said, I think he has. But we're that... saying he's the best rookie of all time. Yeah. And... So I'm wondering.
Aaron, if he's going to be the first guy that never has that little slump after they get a book on him. I, I won't say he'll be the first guy not to have a slump. I think the curve will be a lot less than what we saw previously. Right. Right. And even Lam in Lamar Jackson or the Patrick Mahomes, these are Lamar's about to be a two time MVP. Yeah. At 26 years old. <laughs> right. Patrick Mahomes was a 26 year old two time MVP. You yeah. know what I'm saying? And even they had a slump. Yeah. And I think CJ Stroud is in that vein of a player from what we saw this year. This he is not guessing. And sometimes you can guess right, especially as a young player. Yeah. Like you get a little bit of beginner's luck, to your point, Joe, because people aren't really prepared for you. Yeah. But like, it, like you said, Will Levis had that one week. Yeah, that, you <laughs> was what right. Happened? <laughs> you was right in what there. What happened with Will Levis? Locked in on Will Levis, <laughs> and it was curtain. It was like, <laughs> you ain't heard from him no more. Right. That is what happens. But yeah. C.J. Stroud, they have not been able to do that in right. season. Not it's going to take a whole offseason for them to break down that for the, with the time that they need. And, again, that's just very special. I think he has a demeanor to him, kind of like Joe Burrow. Yeah. Like, Joe Burrow was very much the same way, like, you ain't you ain't stopping Joe Burrow. Right. If Joe Burrow healthy and he plays bad a game, it ain't gonna be two games. Right. And if he plays bad for it, like it's only a matter of time for he's like, all right, I'm in control of this. CJ Stroud is very in that much in that Joe Burrow lane, yeah. who I did not have in my top five, but he's hurt. Right, right. So right. he don't count. Yeah, don't you count. changed my mind. I'm gonna just let you know. All that. right, well, you, you yeah. in on it. Look, I am a believer now. <laughs> all right. <laughs> We're gonna take a quick break and we'll come back with our last segment talking more NFL playoffs and extra points. All right, last segment here for the Tomahawk Show. We had not recorded in a couple of weeks, and I'm sad, too, because we don't have Fat Nat here with us. We would be remiss if we did not shout out Fat Nat, Man. who could not be with us this week. But we would also be remiss if we didn't shout out Fat Nat's Bang Bang Niner gang going down to the Ravens flock over this little break. I know she was feeling a certain yes. uh, pizzazz. That's probably really why she's so, not right, here. Right, right. Salute to Fat Nat. Get well soon, my sister. Yeah, yeah. She's trying to get a show <laughs> under her belt before they come back because <laughs> Lamar Jackson definitely... Uh, did it to you on national uh, television, Niner gang. But that being said, the the, the kind of biggest conversation we had since we've been out was the uh, racism bowl. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Everybody was talking about it. The all white team versus the all black team. Former NFL running back Rashad Mendenhall <laughs> came out and said that the Pro Bowl should be changed to an all black, all white, and it it sparked a lot of conversation, mostly jokes, which was the best part of it, which is why you love football. Yeah. Number one, the take is crazy because that's what makes football great is that you need a little bit of everybody for it truly to work. Right. But Will Compton, friend of the show, uh, from Busting with the Boys, came out with his all-white squad. And, yeah. you know, the conversation kind of came and went. So we're a little late. Um, but it wouldn't be an all-black squad if we weren't a little late. So yeah. this is our opportunity, Juju, in studio here to talk about it with my man Joe, who, if you did an all-time all-white squad, I am a thousand percent sure Joe Thomas makes the squad. <laughs> right. No Absolutely, doubt. Absolutely. That's sure. their left tackle. For sure. All-time all-white, <laughs> Joe yeah. Thomas is the left tackle, which is saying something. Yeah. For Football sure. Football has been around a very long time. Joe, first off, congratulations. Number two, what were your thoughts on the uh, the the race war bowl? It's uh, kind of fun to think about Richard Mendenhall because he does have some wild takes, and uh, I know he's. He's had some struggles mentally over the years. And, and I think when he made this take, like he was very upset about it. Mm -hmm. And Jameis Winston, not to compare the two, but like when he says crazy stuff, he got a lot more people that like hearing from him because he says it with such joy in his voice and, <laughs> and his eyes. He's like when he says, yeah, everyone was following me. When I heard about this take, the first thing I thought was, wow, this is really going to get interesting on Twitter. And it sure did. But <laughs> I, uh, shout out to Will Compton because he did a great job kind of steering the conversation on social media from like mm -hmm. right. all the haters coming out and people making it like this evil race thing to like, hey, let's have some fun with it. And like, let's see fun. how deep we can dive into this thing while having a good time with it and keeping it light and show to the world that America has moved a little bit. We've moved the ball a little bit away from our races past yeah. into an ability to kind of laugh at ourselves yeah. about our racial differences and that, you know, we've proven that we've matured a little bit. And so <laughs> right. I like that. And my favorite take, I don't know who said this, but they yeah. were asking like, okay, we know like certain positions uh, it's obviously going to be pretty heavily dominated by one side or the other, especially yep. in the secondary. Yes, you know, Jason Seahorn is about the only white guy that would yep. even have a, a chance to sniff coverage in this bowl. He would still get smoked. Uh -huh. But uh, when you start talking about the officials, 
Like that's one that we really yeah. could really dive pretty deep into it right. because I'm yeah. not sure who's on that all pro black and all pro white officiating Official squad. Who was officiating? That's definitely a conversation I'd love to. You got to have half and half to officiate it, right? I, I mean, the liter the literal jersey for the ref is black and white. Right. So you got to have half and half. That is. Oh, the Hockley's father and son, Ed and, and his daddy. Yeah, Hockley's. Hockley's. Sean, Hockley's. Ed and Sean. For sure. Oh, the Hockley's are in it. Just Absolutely. For your, just for that. You know what I mean? Yeah. But no, for sure. I mean, I, it is. A, a, uh, to say America has moved past its racial past. Yeah. That is a. That's a nuanced take. <laughs> right. What I said was we've moved the ball slightly beyond where we were with our yeah. tough racial history. And index this cards is, worth of progression. <laughs> we're proving that we're moving in the right direction. Okay, we're there you go. We're able to laugh about some of, I, some of the differences culturally, and we've come together a bit. I agree, especially on this point, because it was such a ridiculous take right. that everyone did make like right. it light, light of it. It was like, okay... We yeah. all know this is the crazy take in the game of football. Yeah. Basketball, it might have got a little bit more tense. Right. It was because <laughs> when they were started drafting, there wouldn't have been as large of a pool. But yeah. in football, in our beautiful sport, you literally like cannot make that argument with a straight face and really have any uh, right. validation to it. That being said, Joe, I do like the All Black squad. What are you guys doing <laughs> at the cornerback position? Three of them. That's that's what I want to know. Well, that's the biggest problem, right? Like, I don't think that uh, there's any white guys out there, no matter how racist they are, that they can really make a solid argument that, <laughs> that there is one position that the whites have dominated the way the blacks have dominated in the secondary. Uh -huh. And so there's really no equal playing field. Like, it's just how many points do the blacks have to give us whites to <laughs> call it? Like, all right, all right, we get eight points, we get nine points. Now we can <laughs> scheme it up a little bit and try to lose by less than a touchdown yeah. and find a way to call that a victory. Because even if you're playing soft zone with like eight white DBs out there, like we're still getting roasted by the all-time black receiver team. Yeah, it's tough, man. I, I was, I was going to say, at receiver, give me, I don't know, anybody. Right. Because uh, <laughs> we're only running all go. Right, and also Mike McDaniel is our offensive coordinator. I, I've seen some 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 takes that he was <laughs> on the white squad, and no, because the Niners got a a Rooney Rule pick right. when he left for the Miami Dolphins. They didn't get twenty five percent of a pick; they got the whole thing. That is our OC. <laughs> We're running all go, and again, Dick LeBeau on one side. Allen from Remember the Titans on the other right. side. Staring down. Uh, Staring down A.J. Gent. Brown and right. nah, Tyreek. And... Rand Randy Miles and one on this side and <laughs> Justin Jefferson on this side and Tyreek in the slot. Joe, I will say, at tight end, we are we have we have not been holding oh, up our end point. of the market at, uh, at tight end. I we feel have, like Joku putting up a Hall of Joku Fame. Joku is doing great. <laughs> right. I, he is our only option right now at the tight end. That is uh, very, very... Oh. Definitively oh. <laughs> hailed by the all white squad at the moment. It, where does Tony Gonzalez fall? Because I feel like he's. If we're all black. time, we're good. However, right. He is one of maybe you could make a real good argument. He's the greatest tight end of all time. But I, honestly, I don't know what his racial background is. His last name is yeah. Gonzalez. Right. So There's a lot going on there. I don't would, know. Would you allow some type of drafting like yeah. first person to. I mean, they might honestly. Or there might to be a hard for him. There might be a mixed race team that might wash that all go of us. Crazy, to yeah. be honest, it might sure. go nuts. And if we're going all time mixed race, Gonzalez is probably the tight end. But right. I would also say, if it's currently, is what I was thinking. And I would have made an argument two years ago. Mm -hmm. I would have oh, petitioned. I would have petitioned for Travis Kelsey two years ago. But yeah. now he's a Swifty, <laughs> and I you get no argument or pushback from me there. Right. We we shallow at uh, so tight if end. it's current players then there is no secondary elements that are white. <laughs> We're going to have to take all New England slot receivers and move them to the secondary for the all-white team. For sure. All right, well, that does it for this episode of the Tomahawk Show. We appreciate all of you joining in. We're happy to be back. We will see you next week, same time, same place. Shout out to the DraftKings Network and Metal Lark Media. And, of course, all of the Tom of Flock. Make sure you check us out anywhere you listen to podcasts, on the Lebertard Show YouTube page, and on the DraftKings Network at 4 p.m. Eastern on Wednesdays. Without further ado, Joe? I'll feed her, Zane. Joe Hawk <laughs> <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
Thank you.